invite you to stand with us as we worship our God together. We invite you to greet each other with the love of Christ this morning. Give a handshake or a hug. All right, well, at this time, I'll invite you to remain standing as you're able this morning. Uh, we're going to profess our faith together like we do each and every week, and we'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed as our guide. So will you join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. So nice to see all of you here this morning. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at Covenant. Welcome to worship. Uh, If you're new to Covenant, an especially warm welcome to you. We are so glad that you chose to spend this Sunday morning worshiping here with us uh, at Covenant. God has given us a vision to be and build a community connecting in Christ. Uh, And so we'd love to just welcome you into that community. In the seat backs in front of you, you'll see two cards. One of those cards is a prayer card. That prayer card is there because we earnestly believe that not only has God called us to be uh, a people, us the church, a people of prayer, but because we believe that God has the power and the desire to answer our prayers when we ask. And so if you have a prayer that's on your heart, uh, this can be a need or a trial, uh, an illness, someone in your life, a loved one, a neighbor, someone in your community, or it can be a celebration, a a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Whatever it is, we want to come alongside of you in those prayers, and so you can fill that out on the card and leave it in the chest on your way out of the sanctuary doors to your right. The other card says I'm new, and if you are new to Covenant, again, welcome. Uh, This card is a great first step. If you're wondering, what does it mean to be a community connecting in Christ, or or where might I fit in this community of Covenant? Uh, This is a great first step. There's a space for some contact info, and I would love the privilege to be able to connect with you, to reach out to you, uh, to get to know your names, know your story, answer any questions you have, and welcome you into our church family. So that card can be put in the chest on your way out the sanctuary as well. At this time, I'll invite the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering, and I'm going to offer just a couple of quick invitations. The first is, if you are a woman in this church who um, is not available during the weekday, but you love women's Bible study, raise your hand if that's you. Yeah, you don't have to be shy. All right, I see the hands. So we have something really exciting coming up. There is a Radiant Bible Study. Radiant is the name of the women's Bible study at the Woodlands Methodist Church. And and we as a campus of the Woodlands Methodist Church are so excited to pilot that for the very first time here at Covenant on Thursday evenings. Uh, And so if you are a woman, maybe you work during the day, you can't come to the Thursday morning Bible study, or it's just not a good time for you, you prefer evenings, sign up for Thursday nights. It's coming up just here on... September 12th? No, that's not right. It's, it, oh, that's the morning one. Okay, yeah. So could you find the weekday evening one, Nick, because there's a different QR code. Yeah. 26. Okay, so, but I'd love for you to be able to, to sign up. If the QR code doesn't pop up, you can go to the website and sign up there. Uh, September the 26th. We'll have another couple of weeks to get this slide right for y'all. So I hope that you'll join the women of this community for uh, the Radiant Bible Study on the 26th Thursday evenings. There it is. We'll leave that up for just a second so you can snag it. Um, The next invitation that I have is last week we kicked off our second annual prayer campaign. The purpose of the prayer campaign is for us as a church family Uh, to encourage one another to take a step forward in our relationship with God through prayer. Uh, Prayer is something God has called all believers to be about, and all of us are coming from different places uh, in our prayer lives, our life of prayer. Uh, And so this prayer campaign, there's an opportunity next Sunday to make a pledge, just like we do in stewardship, make a pledge of what we're going to give to the Lord of our financial resources. Now we get the opportunity to make a pledge what we're Uh, going to give to the Lord in terms of our own hearts through prayer. So there's going to be an opportunity for you to take a step forward in prayer in one of three ways, or three of three ways, personal prayer, communal prayer, and missional prayer. We heard about personal prayer last week, and now I'd like for you to join me in welcoming Megan to share a, a word about communal prayer. Sorry, you're just getting a lot of me and Zach's voices today. Um, so Communal prayer believes that there is power in our populated presence. And there has been so many instances in my life where praying with other believers is not only a declaration that 
we believe Thessalonians where it says where two or more are gathered in his name, he is present. And so not only has that been a declaration in my life and a belief in that truth, but it has spurred and encouraged my faith to be reminded that we have a God that sees and hears us as I'm committing to that when I'm with other people. But the truth is, um, we can gather together as believers in a lot of different ways. And one of the ways that has been so transformational in my life for several years is I have silent alarms set on my phone. And these alarms go off all throughout the day and prompt me to pray for different things. For example, um, me and a couple of friends have an alarm set every day for 10.02. And the alarm pops up and it just says Luke 10.2. And that, in that verse says that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray that the Lord would send harvesters <laughs> to the field. And so every single day, me and a couple of those friends have that alarm that goes off at the exact same time every single day. And we can just stop and pray together and believe in that there is power in our prayer together. Um, and so I know that in this prayer campaign last year, the communal prayer focus was to have designated times to pray the Lord's Prayer. And what a powerful thing, right? We, we do that communally together every Sunday as believers, and we declare what we believe is true, and we ask the Lord for things like our daily bread and to forgive us of our trespasses. And so I'm super excited and encouraged for what that might look like for us. But I would just invite you, um, as it's been such a personal, um, wonderful practice and discipline, to be reminded that uh, God sees us, God hears us, and there is power when we pray together as a simple practice as setting an alarm on my phone every day and that prompting me to pray without ceasing. Thank you, Megan. We join me in thanking her. Yeah, so next Sunday is Commitment Sunday. There's an opportunity for you to make a pledge. If you're not going to be here, uh, this QR code does take you to the digital pledge card, and you could do this at any point. It'll be on the website as well uh, if you just want to check it out and begin to pray through what the Lord might be inviting you to do in your life with Him of prayer. And, and so uh, in that spirit, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now as we continue in worship. Oh, come Holy Spirit. We are your church. We are your people. You are our God. And so I invite you right now, congregation, to just take a moment uh, to put God at, at the forefront of your mind's eye. Whatever's in your heart right now, whatever sort of week you're coming from, just offer him yourself authentically, genuinely. Here we are, God. We love you because you first loved us.
my shepherd and he is everything I need so I will not worry I will not fear the enemy he said that he loves me he said that he's with me even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death and still I know he has good he has good plans for me, so I will take heart in deserts and gardens. He has good plans. He has good plans for me. If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans. is my savior so why should i doubt my victory why should i question the rod and the staff that comforts me he quiets the waters he quiets the storm inside of me what could be better than walking with him
such as we could sing something like if I know my father then I know this to know you to be known by you there is no greater gift So as your children, Father, we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You may be seated. Kids, you're dismissed to head back to Cuff Kids. I hope you all have a great time. It's from Revelation chapter 19. Verses 6 through 9. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kevin. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we are indeed so thankful for your true words that are revealed to us in your holy scriptures. Lord, I ask that you would uh, be amongst us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, that we would come to 
be in communion and fellowship not only with one another, but also with you in the deepest and most intimate of ways. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes that we would see, open our ears that we would hear. Open our minds that we come to know and understand your word, our hearts that we would feel its power. And then in response, I pray, O oh God, that you would open our hands, that we as your people would offer grace to your world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So my wife and I, we, we've been married for 22 years, but we are college sweethearts. Uh, we started dating sophomore year of college, and I'll never forget we were uh, at her family home that winter break you know Christmas break our junior year and uh, and I, I woke up early and was sitting there with uh, my now mother-in-law Nana and she uh, and I were sitting and having a conversation and all of a sudden the conversation shifted and I got a little nervous as one does whenever you're in that point of a relationship and uh, my now mother-in-law looked at me and said, Jason, I believe that you might have intentions to marry my daughter. I said, why, yes, I think that's, uh, that's what we both are interested in. And she said, well, I need you to know that it takes one year to plan a proper southern wedding. So... It's Christmas, and if you plan on my daughter moving with you wherever you go after college, you have only a few months in order for me to make arrangements. And I was like, wow, I, I got marching orders, right? It was like, step to it. Yeah. Get off your duff and make this happen is basically how I interpreted that. And, 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 and you know what? I, I, I was obedient. I followed orders by April. She had a ring on her finger, right? And then my, my mother-in-law could plan. But planning weddings is an enormous task. And, and it, it's more enormous for the groom than for anyone else. You, you disagree, you, I, hey, I'm about to testify here, listen up. Uh, I know that some of you think that it's an enormous task for the bride, and she has all of this pressure and all of the plans to make. I understand, brides, you've had it tough. God bless you, I'll pray for you. And some of you think it's on the mother, the, the, the mother of the bride, and I understand that. The mother of the bride is trying to make all of her daughter's wishes come true, and the dreams of, uh, of this day are all trying to be advanced, and I understand that the mother of the bride has it tough. Some of you might think the father of the bride has it tough because they're trying to figure out how in the world we're going to pay for it all. Understandable, but here's the deal. The groom has it the toughest, and here's why. Come on. The groom, the groom is trying to walk a tightrope that no one else can ever understand. The groom has to do just enough to show that they are fully invested, participating, doing their part. They are going to do what is necessary. And simultaneously, they cannot do so much that they are stepping on anyone's toes, specifically the bride and the mother of the bride. The, the groom throughout the entirety of the process is walking this tightrope just trying to make sure they do enough and don't do too much all at the same time. It's a tough life for a groom. I don't think y'all believe me, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, but, but this, is, this is this both end. Do your part, but don't do anything that's not your part. And I think that there's a beauty to that that we could learn from. So here in, in the scriptures, we, we find ourselves continuing in our series, uh, Ecclesia, where we are studying the different metaphors for the church of Jesus Christ. Who are we as the church? What, what are the different ways that scripture uh, defines us and describes us? And today we come to the fact that we, the church of Jesus Christ, are the bride. All of us... Together, uh, as Christians, those that have offered their lives to Jesus, we are the bride. And, and, and when we hear that we're the bride, we, we, we might uh, be wondering, well, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? And how can I, I faithfully live into that role and function? And the scriptures guide us well. 
Now, because we are in Revelation, we're going to walk through this text step by step, stage by stage, so that, that, that we can make sure we're all understanding not, not only the imagery of the bride, but also the other imagery that comes along with it. Because at times, we can uh, just approach Revelation and immediately we're intimidated and uh, we're confused before we even start, even if the text really isn't that confusing. So we're going to journey through this, and, and, and it opens up with this this beautiful scene, and, and I want to uh, lay a little bit of context. Uh, we have just heard in chapter 18 uh, the, the fall of Babylon, which is really the fall of evil and, and, and this evil empire that has worked against God over the course of history. And so uh, the finality of Babylon's doom is foretold. And now there's a hallelujah raised over that doom. There's a celebration that begins to ensue after the announcement of evil's demise has come. And so whenever we, uh, whenever we hear this chapter 19, hallelujah over Babylon's fall, when we arrive at verse 6, there's a, this shift and there's new language for us. In verse 6, it says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like peals, loud peals of thunder shouting. Now, these two images work simultaneously and all uh, with this, 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 this multitude ringing this out. And, and I think the, these images are really interesting choices uh, to uh, articulate. And, and remember that the prophet here is writing... Uh, and, and interpreting what he sees, experiences, and receives. Some of them are literal words that he hears and receives, but then he also is describing it. And in this description, there's such beauty. The first is, is that there's a roar of rushing waters. I, I love hiking. Many of you know this. I love hiking, particularly in the mountains. And oftentimes, I like hiking to a, a destination of sorts, a, a mountain lake or a waterfall. I love hiking to waterfalls. Uh, I love hiking to waterfalls, particularly uh, the, the bigger the better. And sometimes you'll, you'll hike to a waterfall where uh, the waterfall is rushing down for, for 100 feet. And the beauty of, of that hike is oftentimes you begin hearing the water's rushing long before you can ever see it. And, and in many ways, it gives you a little bit of hope and enthusiasm, energy, because if you've been on a long hike, your legs are burning, your quads are just, just tapped out, and you don't know how you're going to actually make it all the way there. And then you hear the waters rushing from a distance, and you continue on until you can fully perceive that which you yet haven't been able to see. You are anticipating that. You hear it. And then you're able to see it. You hear it before you perceive it. And then you have the, the second of these images, the loud peals of thunder. Now, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes thunder will make you jump, right? Like if thunder is really loud enough, it's going like, to give you a little bit of a jolt and you're going to feel the energy rush through your body as you hear that thunder. And sometimes, though, the thunder is right on top of you. But remember now, you could hear thunder off in the distance. You could hear it from a long way away, and, and as it gets closer, the sound gets greater, and, but it's an in anticipation of what is to come. You could hear it before you experience it, and then eventually, when it's right on top of you, it all collides and connects together. The, the author here is, is helping us understand that that this fall of evil, uh, this, this uh, opportunity for all of us to live into the goodness of God where he, through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit with his people, have gained victory over the evil one entirely and forever. That that is something that we hear before we experience it. And as it approaches, that sound gets louder and louder so that it's not just the volume that we're supposed to hear of, but we're also supposed to gain anticipation and let it grow within us along the way. So we hear this, this sound, this, uh, this multitude, and what is the multitude saying? Well, the, the, the early portion of this is, is, 
it is, is easy for us to connect to. It's obvious, it seems. It's a great multitude that says, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. And, and that is enthusiastic for us. I loved how Kevin read it because that's exactly how we should read it as well. It is uplifting. And yet, it's challenging for us because if you've read through Revelation and, and you've read through the chapters that have preceded it, uh, what, where we arrive uh, today in chapter 19, you'll see such calamity such chaos, you'll be challenged by imagery that really overwhelms, and, and, and at moments you'll even be intimidated, intimidated or saddened. And here, we arrive at the beginning of the capstone of Revelation, and we move, we shift from calamity to peace, to celebration, to overjoyed uh, exclamation that we here have, hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. And it continues on and it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Now, now why? Why do we need to give him glory? Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. We, we haven't yet seen the victory won. We've just seen it foretold. So why are we giving him glory? And then we arrive at the critical turning point where we can shift from the fact that we are anticipating this, uh, this victory to the victory being realized and our part in the midst of that victory. You see, the second half of verse 7 turns the corner for us. It opens with, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. And then it says, for, because... What comes before connects to what is after. What is after is where we find ourselves in this story. It says, for the wedding of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Let us rejoice for the wedding of the lamb has come. Now, uh, the wedding of the lamb, some of us might, might need to be connected to, to who is this lamb and what is this wedding. Well, uh, this, this lamb is, is Jesus, and Jesus is referred to as the lamb of God uh, multiple times throughout Scripture. And, and this lamb imagery even connects to uh, the Old Testament, this, this journey of, of Exodus where the people of God are saved from death. And given freedom and liberty uh, through God's work and the, and the work of the Passover lamb. But the Passover lamb is then imagery that's laid upon Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 29... Uh, we see that Jesus is now entering into the scene. This is the very beginning of the Gospel of John. And, and, and we have all of the, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then there's a turn, and it, now it's about this intersection of Jesus and John the Baptist. This relationship between Jesus and his cousin. And he says, John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is Jesus. And, and, and John reiterates that another time, uh, just a few verses later. He, he's with his disciples after this interaction. And there is Jesus walking by. And, and, G, and, and John points to his disciples and says, hey, hey, disciples, look, that is the Lamb of God. That is the Lamb of God, and then John's disciples follow Jesus instead of John the Baptist. This is to be significant. Jesus is the Lamb. He's the Lamb whose self-sacrifice would pay the price for our sin, for your sin and mine, for the sin of the entire world. So now when we come to Revelation and we hear this beautiful passage that says we are arriving at a wedding banquet this wedding has come to fulfillment and here we have the lamb of god jesus himself and we have his bride his church his church that that we hear has made herself ready 
the bride has made herself ready. Well, immediately when we, are, when we get to that, we're like, well, what do I have to do to make myself ready? If I am the bride, I am the church, we are the church together. How do we make ourselves ready? And, and we start thinking about all of our roles and responsibilities, things that we could accomplish, achieve, fulfill. We might think about some sort of uh, ritualistic penitence that we need to, uh, that we need to walk through in, in some sort of regularity in order to make ourselves ready, or we need to achieve a certain state standard of Christianity so that we could be considered uh, uh, holy in a certain way, shape, or form. Or maybe we would hear, hey, the lamb is going to receive the bride and the bride is making herself ready. Maybe we hear that we need to make ourselves perfect. We need to be perfect, spotless, blameless, and it's something that you and I need to achieve. Maybe that's what we think. But none of that is accurate. None of that is according to Scripture. All of those are the temps of the evil one, the the, the voice of Satan that's speaking into us, trying to, to coax us, coerce us, to discount the capacity of Jesus, the sacrifice that he's made and what he is calling us to, and substitute ourselves for Jesus, making ourselves little gods who have made the way for ourselves. That is not the gospel. And in very simple terms, uh, Revelation records this for us. How do we make ourselves ready? For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. And then we move to verse 8. The bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. Quite simply... We have to put on the right clothes. We have to put on the fine linen, white and clean, bright and clean, so that we would be uh, prepared that that covering of those clothes would present us to our bridegroom, to Jesus, as blameless and spotless. But here is the, the beautiful thing. This, this, these, this wedding gown it's not of our own making or choosing. Choosing It is given to us. So whenever you go through those wedding preparations, what's the most important decision you make in wedding preparations? Choosing the pastor, I know. Like that was number one, right? Uh, choosing who the preacher was going to be, uh, number one on the list. Uh, no, no, probably the most important is who you're going to marry. Okay, so that's good. And here we have Jesus, the bridegroom, and we are the bride. So that's, that, that, that's a good fit. Uh, praise God for that. But then the next most important choice you make, maybe at least because it's been sensationalized in our culture, would be the dress. Say yes to the dress. I can't tell you how many times that was on in my home and I walked through the living room or the bedroom while my daughter or my wife had that television show on. And I got to say, it's not awful. I, I, I would just stand there and watch, you know, and, and, and they would say, stop standing there like a man because I would like, like, you know, TV, ah, uh, uh, but, but the whole theme of say yes to the dress was, hey, here's the bride and the mother of the bride and a, a, a gaggle of friends. There's always some sort of conflict. I mean, there's, there was never an episode of say yes to the dress where everybody was happy. Never happened. Uh, there, there was going to be some sort of conflict. The, one of the bridesmaids thought one of the dresses was ugly that the bride really liked. And then, like, how are we going to deal with it? And everybody's trying to figure this out. And, and, and in the end, when the bride and, and enough, uh, maybe a... You know, a majority report of the uh, people in the, in the audience, uh, her bridesmaids and mother, they would all stand there whenever she said yes to the dress. But in that moment, the bride is choosing the dress. The bride is giving uh, her vision of what the dress should look like, what her personality is, uh, whether she's more formal or informal, whether she wants to train or not, and, and, and how long she wants it to be. And, and I guess even the color, over the, uh, even though most of the episodes I saw, these were white dresses. I, you know, all of these different elements the bride is having input in. 
And the bride is, is, is having someone, this kind of specialist, go in and choose different dresses according to her desires. That is not how our wedding garb is chosen as Christians when we relate to Jesus. One of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture is here in verse 8, and it's the word given. This fine linen, bright and clean dress that we receive as Christians is nothing that we achieved on our own, but rather it's the gift of God for us. It covers us and makes us clean. It makes us worthy. Jesus, our groom, in fact, uh, makes the sacrifice by which we are able to be presented and, and receive this gift so that we would be presented to him in this way. Now, I, I want you to, to hear that parenthesis, this explanation of what this fine linen uh, stands for. It uh, Verse 8 closes with this. It says, the fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. It's the righteous acts of God people, God's people, but it's not the acts that we did of our own strength, will, or volition. But rather, it's the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us that uh, gives us the capacity to work out our righteousness with fear and trembling so that we then can be clothed with this gift of God in Jesus Christ. It's so so magnificent to see how we have received this gift and this covering is now what we wear to our wedding with our lamb, our groom, Jesus himself. Well, I want you to know that this wedding comes with power. The outcome of this wedding, this opportunity that we have to, to be eternally married to Jesus is for us power. And, and we would miss it if we didn't turn a little bit further in chapter 19. I'm going to read a passage. It's chapter 19, 11 through 14. And I want you to hear what happens after the wedding. After the wedding, uh, we then have a role to play with Jesus. And here's what it says in 1911. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That would be Jesus, Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. This is the Lord, the I Am. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, representing his sacrifice on the cross for you and for me, that he would die and his blood would have that redeeming power for us. And his name is the Word of God. Now, that word of God is both in Genesis 1 and John chapter 1, and here it comes to us again. That word is Jesus, Logos, Jesus. The armies of heaven, now this is where we come in. Pay attention. This is where we come in, verse 14. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. The armies of heaven dressed in, in white and clean fine linen. And we just heard that the, the fine linen, white and clean, stands for the righteous acts of God people. And that, that, that we are then clothed in that on the wedding day. Which means that, that our ability to be yoked with Jesus through his sacrifice for us to put on that dress, that, that wedding garb, allows us to then fight evil and defeat the beast and the false prophet so that they would have no sway over anything for all of eternity. We join with Jesus in a final battle through this gift that he's given. Now I said the groom has the hardest task at the wedding. You have to walk this tightrope, do just enough but not too much. And I think that the same is there for us as Jesus' bride, the church. We, the church, are to receive his gift and understand all that he has done for us. That he has sacrificed himself on the cross. That he has loved the world, all of the world. Not just those that he knew in that day and time and not just those that he was in relationship with. But the entire world. 
and we see that gift of Christ and we work out our salvation with fear and trembling and put on his clothes of righteousness. That's all we do. And yet it has power for eternity. Brothers and sisters, you, me, all of us together, we are the bride of Christ. And the wedding is coming. Let's make ourselves ready. Would you pray with me? Lord, what an extraordinary gift to to hear that you uh, would call us forth as heavenly armies, that we would be able to, to see victory over evil alongside you. Lord, we come before you fully acknowledging that we're not capable of of righteousness, of our own accord, of our own account. But Lord, we pray that the power of the Holy Spirit, your power would be in us. That you would give us strength and capacity to walk with you. Lord, help us to put on these clothes of righteousness. Help us to receive them as your gift. And so, Lord, as we enter into this time of listening prayer and we, and we seek to hear from you, we, we, we know that you are ever more ready to meet with us than we are to meet with you. But we are ready now, even in this time, to meet with you. So, Lord, we pray that, that you would speak clearly. If there are any barriers that we have that are in the way, any, any, any drive towards achievement or perfection or or idolatry of self, Lord, we ask that you would speak that to us so that it could be cast out. If there's any need for surrender or, or, or holy reception to receive this good and perfect gift, Lord, I pray that you, would, that you would soften our hearts to receive it. Lord, speak to us in this time as we come and meet with you. Our ears are open. We're ready to hear. great God. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for speaking to us.
Let our connection with you today be something that carries us through to the next point of connection later today and the next and the next and tomorrow morning and the next and the next and all throughout the week. We love you. And we thank you that you loved us first. In Christ. Amen. Church, I invite you to please stand. We're going to sing one final song together this morning. you to clap. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting vagabond Just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know He told me that I was not alone Pick me up Turn me around And place my feet on solid ground I think the master I think the savior choice but to believe my doubts are burned like ashes in the wind so long to my old friends a burden and bitterness just keep them moving nah you ain't welcome here now till I walk the streets go Sing of how you save my soul. This wayward son has found his way back. Oh, 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 oh. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name forever. Free, I'm not the same. I think the master. I think the Savior, I thank God. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. All right, this is your chance to start clapping again. We're going to sing this like we mean it. This is our song of celebration. We thank you for this, Jesus. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Like you mean it. Hell lost another one.
Amen. Amen. Lord, we go forth from this place with joy in our hearts because you have set us free and given us the best gift of all, life in you. So we make ourselves ready each and every day to be joined with Christ for eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters.